Welcome to the, the Living with Fire virtual series. Um, this is part of the Nevada Wildfire Awareness Campaign. And this is brought to you by the Bureau of Land Management, Nevada State Office, the Nevada Division of Forestry, the U.S. Forest Service Humboldt Tayabi, in cooperation with University of Nevada Reno Extension. So my name is Jamie Royce Combs, and I'm the manager of the Living with Fire program. Um, before we get into this presentation, I just want to have a reminder to folks that um, we will have the PowerPoint as well as the recording made available um, in a few weeks for, for all of the attendees. Um, it's a, a big question in these, um, so they will be made available. They will be emailed to you. I'm going to go over the agenda really quickly. I'm going to do some housekeeping. And then we're gonna do some pre-workshop polls. Um, these are anonymous. You will see statistics, but you won't see names associated with any of these answers. Then I'm gonna introduce you to the main speaker. Then we will do some post-workshop polls. And again, these will be anonymous um, and we, I won't be sharing in any of those results. And then we're gonna go into the Q&A session. Um, it looks like this is a small workshop. So actually we might, and ask uh, um, folks to just ask questions during the, the presentation. But let me get to housekeeping. So this is the screen that you are seeing. Um, please mute yourself during the presentation. Um, and um, as hosts, we have the ability to mute you if, if you're wondering who muted you. Um, you know, usually during big presentations, we ask that folks please turn off your video, but if you would like to turn on your video, you are more than welcome to. Um, we might turn this into more of an interactive presentation since this is a smaller workshop. Um, we, we're going to have folks ask questions in the, the Q&A. You would go to the chat and then you would click on questions for speakers and you would type a, a question and then those questions would be emailed to me and I can bring it up. Or if you'd like to ask questions during the presentation, you can ask during the presentation. Um, if you would like to change your view, you'd go up here to um, view at the top right corner of your screen. Um, the gallery view is where you can uh, view all of the attendees in a grid-like pattern, or you can end up clicking on speaker and just to view who is speaking. And if you would like to leave the workshop, um, you'd click the bottom right-hand corner. Oh, am I, is this the leave the workshop? If you'd like to leave the workshop, you'd click right here, bottom right-hand corner. Okay, now if we were in person, we would have this justice for all poster up, um, but we are in a virtual format. But I just want to let you know that extension programs are federally funded um, and our programs are open to everyone. There's a USDA contact information here if you would like to um, reach the USDA and, and find out more, or you can even email us at lwf at unr.edu. Okay, so we are going to go to the pre-workshop poll. Um, I'm going to ask Megan, our outreach coordinator, if she could share the pre-workshop poll. So we're just asking folks where they live. Um, it gives us a, a better idea of who is attending. Um, so just go ahead and click on what state you live in, or if you don't live in the United States, please click that. We are asking folks to um, state their affiliation too. Um, do you identify yourself as a landowner, as a homeowner? Um, are you part of a fire agency? And then we're just asking about your general knowledge about uh, fire behavior. Okay, so it looks like everybody has voted. I'm going to end that polling. And I'm going to share these results. 
So it looks like a majority of you are from Nevada. And um, two of you are from uh, affiliated with uh, another entity and two of you are homeowners. Um, let's see. And we have folks here who are really familiar with uh, weather and fire behavior. So I'm gonna stop sharing these results. So I, for the, about the, the last week and a half, two weeks, we experienced um, a heat wave. Um, some areas have had record temperatures um, for our, their region in, in this time of the year. And then temperatures dropped 20 to 30 degrees. There's been high winds and we've had red flag warnings in much of the state. And um, we've also had some wildfires pop up. Um, and this is actually a, a great opportunity to um, have our speaker talk about weather and fire behavior. And so I am going to introduce Dr. Tim Brown. He is with the Desert Research Institute. He is a research professor and climate and director of Western Regional Climate Center. So welcome, Tim. Thank you very much, uh, Jamie, and uh, hello, everyone. Let me go into share screen mode. All right, I think I think that's working. So I'm going to try something a, a little different uh, today than just, um, I guess, going through a a bunch of slides and more of a lecture style. I want to try telling this as, as a, a bit more of a story. But as we go along, if there's a place that you like to ask a question about, that's fine. Uh, we can make this very uh, conversational and, and interactive. So let's use our imaginary imaginations and let's place ourselves in an imaginary but realistic timeline here in Reno. Let's say it's not June 10th, 2021, but instead late July of no particular year, but yet everything is still familiar uh, to us. A wildfire started today near the edge of Northwest Reno and the fire is growing in size and fire agencies are working to control it. Evacuation orders may soon be put in place. Broadcast and social media, they're providing continuous updates. But the question is why today? Why this fire today? And what were the fire's beginnings? I'm gonna take us back to say two winters ago. It's a drought year. Snowpack is much below normal. A miracle March winter storm did not occur and the dry continued through the spring. As you can see on this map, this is the US drought monitor map. It has red nearly everywhere. And brightest colors um, are extreme drought or exceptional drought. And there's some, some dark colors on this map. So we know that we have underlying drought conditions. In fact, turns out it's the third consecutive year of drought. And each year has been getting progressively drier. So I'm gonna take you through a sequence here of satellite images and watch the snow decrease in the Sierra. At the same time, these images are effectively the, the same time of year, but watch it decrease for the three consecutive years. So that's pretty impressive decline in snowpack. And obviously we're interested in snowpack, not just for fire, but also for our, our water resources in the region. So we have this drought underway and the forests up in the Sierra and around Lake Tahoe are getting highly stressed, increasing the potential for significant fire. 
And also we've had a long-term warming trend going on. And so the recent warmer temperatures are also allowing for the bark beetle tree mortality. And so here we see a little bit of both in this particular photo. So drought is not unusual here in the West. I mean, it's part of the region's natural climate variability. As I highlight here in a Ken Burns style of, of looking at a photo, a three-year drought is nothing compared to climates past. The 1930s Dust Bowl is but one of a not so distant example, but droughts can be much bigger than those years. We call it mega drought and it's occurred before. These last for decades to century scale kind of events. Here we have a time series of uh, soil moisture reconstructed based on tree rings. And below uh, we show areas of uh, significant drought corresponding to these mega drought regions. So how much of the West uh, was under this drought, under the mega drought? So the late 800s, the mid 1100s, the late 1200s, and the late 1500s were mega drought periods. Very interestingly here, the early 2000s reached the same dryness level as these previous periods. And the research by Park Williams uh, and others suggests that this was largely driven by anthropogenic warming. So a climate change impact, which makes this different from the other uh, mega droughts and that there was a, a key driver here of this warming trend that's putting us in this place of mega drought territory. So enhanced by warming, we should be concerned about climate's drought future. Now, what else does this warming do? Well, it extracts more moisture from the soil and from the vegetation. This creates a feedback loop and this enhances the drought even more. So while the forest trees feel the stress of the drought, as we saw in that earlier Lake Tahoe picture, the lack of precipitation also means that spring grass growth or fine fuels in fire language, it'll be inhibited. They will not grow as tall and the plant distribution will be sparse. So, Drought can work both ways in fire, depending on the ecosystem that's involved. If it's a forest, it can stress those trees and increase fire potential substantially. But in a grassland environment, it may inhibit the fuels from developing to begin with. And so the fire potential would then be decreased. Fine fuels are flashy. They burn easy, they burn quickly. Of course, we're seeing some of that in forests as well now. But fine fuels, along with breast vegetation, they are a major carrier of fire. This is a picture of the burn scar of the Martin fire back on July 11th in 2018. This is uh, North Central Nevada area. It would take one hour to drive the length of this burn scar. So these can be very large areas and occur very quickly. So now let's say it's one winter from the start of our fire. And it turns out now that we have a much above normal snowpack. So things completely changed. We went from this three year drought period to suddenly um, a very wet winter. And that wet continued through the spring. 
So the trees in the Sierra mostly recovered from the drought. But during the spring, the sage and the rabbit brush flushed and really greened up. And now we have a, a very dense area of brush. But also what happened? By summer, the cheatgrass had grown tall, distributed widely, and now we have acres of cheatgrass across the landscape. And all of that precipitation brought all of this fuel now for a possible fire. But now we might ask, well, where did the wet winter come from that helped create this abundance of vegetation? So El Nino or La Nina, the tropical Pacific warming and cooling of the ocean makes the news a lot when they're around. And known in shorthand as ENSO for El Nino Southern Oscillation, this is a combination of equatorial ocean temperature, surface winds, convection, oceans, thermal decline, all working together that shift on grand scales enough to impact weather in certain locations around the world. Not every place, but there are a lot of locations that these influence. And North America and the US is, is one of those. But here in Reno, it's really a mixed signal as to what ENSO means for us. The precipitation dots here are not correlated to the tropical ocean. The red drops correspond to what occurred given a El Nino event and the cold during a La Nina event and the green if neither was taking place. And as you can see, there's not a lot of difference between these. We still have dry years, we still have wet years, regardless of whether or not there's an El Nino or a La Nina. So the waters of the equatorial Pacific are not an obvious predictor of our winter weather. Sometimes it does influence us, but not all of the time. There are other global teleconnections that can also influence a winter and a fire season. Put a bunch of pictures here to show you these different patterns uh, for different times of the year. They're known by names such as the Pacific Decadal Oscillation or the Pacific North American Pattern, the Arctic Oscillation, North Atlantic Oscillation. There's others on here I didn't include, such as the Madden-Julian Oscillation. So all of these are happening uh, around the globe that could potentially impact uh, our winter season or our fire season here in the West. And these patterns can work together to create warmer dry or warm and dry or cool and wet. So these could set up in such a way that could bring us a wet winter. They could also set up to bring us a dry winter. So there's another possibility to get very wet winters called atmospheric rivers. These are streams of upper atmospheric moisture crossing the Pacific and they crash into the Sierra. And sometimes they're known as drought busters because we can be dry and these can bring substantial amounts of precipitation, um, as much as half of California's precipitation uh, can come from these atmospheric rivers. So for our particular imaginary year that we're talking about here, uh, it turned out that atmospheric rivers over the winter did give us plentiful rain and snow, and that replenished the soil moisture at both the high and low elevations. So the Sierra trees, they soaked up the moisture, but so did the valley seeds of the Bromus tectorum, which has now turned into acres and acres of healthy cheatgrass. 
And as we watch through the season, as it warms and as it dries, as it naturally does, as we move from winter to spring to summer, the grass will change color during a short season from green to purple to brown as it cures during that early summer warmth. And of course, now awaits a, a spark to flash fire across the landscape. So now, let's say it's June. We're two months away from the peak fire season, July and August, and we know we have a heavy fuel loading. So we can look at what are the seasonal climate outlooks? What are they telling us about this summer? The NOAA Climate Prediction Center issues seasonal outlooks for temperature and precipitation. So here we're looking at temperature. And in this case, we've got a lot of orange on here. Uh, so this means above normal temperatures are expected during that season. This will mean the soils and the vegetation will dry during the summer, of course, as it always does, but perhaps this time more rapidly than usual and maybe even more extreme. If you look at these maps on a regular basis, you'll see a lot of orange, a lot of above normal in the West now. And that's because our warming trend is driving this signal. If we look at the corresponding precipitation outlook, we see places in the east that's above normal, some places in the west that are below normal. For us, it's EC, equal chances. And this simply means there is not a strong forecast signal for above, below, or normal precipitation. But we know the summer tends to be dry here anyway, except for the possibility of a very localized a uh, thunderstorm shower. So we could wind up having any above, below, or normal. And maybe now we wait and see, well, what other patterns might bring us some moisture. Now it's been observed that the fuels are getting drier. And this is a term named fuel aridity. And this is from a, a fairly recent uh, research paper showing eight drought indicators. Um, different things, some are directly related to fire, others are directly related to atmospheric uh, moisture. And all of these indicators are showing uh, a reddish color, meaning that this has been a drying uh, trend uh, for the 2000, 2015 period. So basically the last couple of decades, because this has continued uh, up through 2020 since this paper uh, was written. And the climate projections, of course, are indicating that this trend is continued or expected to continue during this century. And again, as a reminder, these rising temperatures and this extreme dryness, this exacerbates wildfires. We wish predictions of North American or the Southwest monsoon were better. This atmospheric phenomenon originating in Mexico works its way northward in mid-June into the Southwest and can hang around into September. It can send blobs of moisture and thunderstorms up into Nevada and even further north. We care about the monsoon because this can be a source of dry thunderstorms and a lightning ignited fire, but know that our local thunderstorms can also come from other weather patterns besides just the monsoon. But this is a key phenomenon that fire folks really pay attention to, especially in the Southwest but also up into the, the Great Basin. Last year, uh, the monsoon didn't really materialize. It was not a strong event. 
And so there was fire in the Southwest through the summer. At the same time, we were having all of our significant fires in, in California and in the Northwest. And this actually very much stressed the firefighting resource capacity because crews uh, needed to be spread out much more than what they might happen in other seasons. So in, this, in our example here, predictive services meteorologists um, in the Great Basin working with BLM, they're monitoring fire danger indicators. And there are really three, three sets of indicators. There's uh, dead fuel moisture, which is assessing the dryness of uh, dead fuels. There's live fuel moisture which as it sounds is assessing the moisture in, in live fuels. And then there are the fire danger indicators themselves, such things that's telling you about the amount of energy at the head of the flaming front or a spread rate of, or uh, how, how intense, how high the, fly, the flames might be in a, in a particular fire. And all of these can combine um, and describe your fire danger conditions. And so when you look at these maps or charts, a lot of this information is also presented in, in time series chart form. Uh, these will highlight the potential problematic areas that have uh, very hot, dry fuels and high fire danger and uh, forecasts of these values can be made as well. And those are looked at. The Great Basin Predictive Services in particular monitors the status of the fuels across the basin and high, again highlighting areas that have increased potential for fire. And so when you take all this information, from, well in this particular example uh, we see areas in red that means the fuels are, are critical and should there be an ignition now in these areas there is the, the potential. Uh, for problematic fire, uh, uh, particularly if the weather is, is uh, hot and dry. Uh, other areas uh, are not so ready uh, at the moment. And maybe some of these won't be uh, so much through the season because if the, the fuels uh, really didn't become uh, available. But combining all this, so combining the recent climate and weather uh, along with all this fuels information, then this begins to yield a picture of how the fire season is, is shaping up. And by the way, this, these fire indicators, fire danger indicators are what's used to decide the level of fire danger that you'll see uh, along the road signs uh, posted entering forests, national parks, and rangelands, or, or other places. So now let's say it's the beginning of uh, July. The significant wildfire outlook shows above normal potential, highlighted in red here for our area and much of the West. This indicates an increased likelihood of significant fire occurrence. Now what that means is, is more fire suppression resources may be needed than usual, brought in from other places around the country. Now firefighting resources are constantly in motion around the country, that's not unusual, but if, you have uh, bad seasons, then there may be this need to have a lot more resources come in than what normally would. And in this particular example, given this much red uh, across the West, uh, firefighting resources could well be strained. These maps are put together, by the way, by sifting through large amounts of past and current and predictive climate information 
uh, combined with the state of the fuels. Uh, these are updated monthly. They actually go out to uh, four months and we'll, at, at the end later, uh, we'll, we'll take a look at what's going on now. Another thing that fire weather meteorologists are watching out for are these critical fire weather patterns. These are atmospheric conditions conducive to bringing heat, dryness, wind, lightning, um, the kinds of things that the weather sets up uh, for fire and potentially problematic fire uh, should there be an ignition. And one other thing now that's starting to get looked at more and more is something called eddy evaporative drought demand index. This is a indicator of evaporative demand, meaning the thirst of the atmosphere uh, to take water from the soil, the vegetation, lakes and rivers. And in this particular example, the uh, red orange colors indicate dry whereas the blue colors would indicate wet. This is scaled to match very similarly to the US drought monitor uh, that we, we saw earlier. And we've got a lot of red uh, and orange uh, across the West. So we know now, you know, based on this, that the atmosphere is taking a lot of extra moisture now out of that vegetation. So it's drying it out and uh, beginning to increase the flammability of those fuels. So this is a new tool. It's uh, still currently being researched for fire. Uh, it was developed at um, the NOAA labs in Boulder, but also uh, the Western Regional Climate Center here at DRI uh, is working on this extensively. Uh, particularly in the realm of fire. And it appears to be useful as an early warning system for fire and potentially weeks uh, ahead of time. So let's say it's now one week from when the fire starts. Fire weather meteorologists from both the National Weather Service and Predictive Services are now monitoring numerous maps of temperature, humidity, wind, and many other meteorology patterns, assessing potential for dry thunderstorms, confirming that fuels are ready to burn, and determining where the biggest problems might be. Predictive Services has a tool indicating the potential for fire, highlighting elevated conditions, and in this case, say for the, the end of the week, you can look at these for uh, a seven day period, seven individual days uh, into the future. So what's happening is the, the fire weather meteorologists are now trying to really key in, uh, is there something imminent uh, on the horizon? In our scenario, three days before the fire starts, the National Weather Service issues a fire weather watch. This is a forecast issued when the combination of dry fuels and weather conditions support extreme fire danger. Watches are issued up to 72 hours before the extreme conditions are expected to occur. And during the fire season, the Weather Service they conduct conference calls with uh, core partners, uh, including the fire management, public safety, and emergency management communities, and uh, dis discuss, explain, and discuss the situation. And on the day of the call that the watch is issued, the forecasters discuss with the officials the expected upcoming weather conditions and why there's reason for concern. And then officials will consider this information as they plan for a potentially bad fire day. So the day before our fire starts, the National Weather Service issues a red flag warning for the region. 
highlighting extreme dry fuels, strong winds, and low relative humidity for tomorrow. Should a fire start, it could spread rapidly and be difficult to control. Both watches and warnings are written primarily for land and fire managers to highlight the increased fire danger, but through local broadcast media, social media, and highway information signs, this information is also provided to the public. If the fire gets large enough, an incident command team will be dispatched. And this will include a National Weather Service Incident Meteorologist, or IMAT, and a US Forest Service Air Resource Advisor as the weather part of the team. IMAT support weather, uh, provide weather support at the fire location, and air resource advisors provide smoke and air quality support at and surrounding the incident for both firefighters and the public. At 3.30, 11 a.m., dispatch receives a 911 call for a wildfire at the base of Peabody Mountain. It is windy. The air is very warm and dry. The fire grows quickly. The red flag warning verified. It turns out that there was no lightning, so the ignition, the ignition must be a human factor. The actual cause will be determined later by fire investigators. But during the incident, decision support systems will be operating and numerous actions will be underway, including resource dispatching, suppression response, incident management support, and firefighter and public safety support. At 2.49 PM, the National Weather Service radar detected a tornado signature within the fire and a warning is issued. Fire whirls are common and sometimes a larger pyro tornado can occur. Fire can create its own weather. And then there's the rare but deadly and very destructive pyro tornado, such as in Redding, California in July of 2018. A large uh, tornadic uh, fire was also in Canberra. Uh, Australia back in 2003. That was destructive and causing fatality. So our fire lasts for three days. A decreasing wind, a brief cool spell, and an increase in moisture helped firefighters contain the fire. But now the job's not done by the fire weather meteorologists because they need to continue to watch the weather and they'll do this through the remainder of the season, looking for those critical fire weather patterns and thinking back about how the climate has helped create the fuels and what kinds of patterns and situations might be coming in, in the next days and, and months through the remainder of the season. So climate enables fire and weather drives fire. But I don't want to stop just there. I want to talk a little bit about this confluence of fire. We did just talk a lot about climate and weather, but these factors alone are not responsible for the increasing trend of large destructive fires. How we manage the lands is another factor, and this is the fuels. For many places across the West, aggressive fire suppression and from an ecological perspective, fire exclusion has been a significant factor of large fire occurrence. So here's a sequence of photos taken over a roughly 40 year period from the same location in the Bitterroot National Forest. And in the upper left photo, you see a very open forest. Uh, in the middle photo, you see that growing in. And in the lower right, it's completely filled in. And when I've shown these before, I often joked about in the upper left, that's a graduate student there. In 1948, it's the same graduate student. And I think the graduate student is still there um, in, the, in the lower right photo. We, we just can't see him. 
So these photos show extensive vegetation growth over time, uh, resulting primarily from land management practices of not allowing fire to burn as it naturally would. But programs are underway to manage fuels, and this is a critical component of reducing fire hazard and restoring healthy landscapes. In some parts of the country, humans dominate the fire starts. Urban areas and human caused fire starts correlate well. In this image, the red dots show places where more fires are started by humans than by lightning. We see a lot of California uh, being the case and much of the East is that way, except for Florida, uh, which has a fair amount of lightning. For us in the West, uh, we see that uh, lightning is uh, more of a, of a dominating factor, but there's still a number of, of human starts in that region. So fires occurred nearly everywhere in the West uh, with varying cycles of occurrence in varying, highly varying ecosystem regimes. And many places are dependent on fire for ecosystem function and health. So it is important that as much as we can, uh, we do return to having, uh, we'll call it good fire uh, on the landscape. People are moving into naturally prone fireplaces. And uh, in these two maps, for near Santa Rosa, California, we see the Tubbs fire perimeter outline from 2018. And by the way, in 1964, there was a fire named the Hanley fire, which overlaid very much on top of this Tubbs fire outline. But the shading is showing people moving into a place since the 1940s where fire easily occurs. And so, Fire today is the intersection or confluence of climate, fuels, and people. And people are responsible for all three. And me and you and all of us are in the middle uh, of this, this intersection. So that's the end of my story. Thanks, Tim. That was really interesting. Thank you. Now, I have I, some stuff about current conditions if folks want to get into that. But if we want to talk about the story, I'm, I'm happy to do that first or however you'd like to do it. Well, how about let's open it up for attendees. I, I actually do want to hear about current conditions. But first, let's let's open it up. Um, does do, do any of you have any questions for Tim? regarding his presentation. Real quickly, I'm gonna just stop your sharing, Tim. Is that okay? Yes. That way we can. I don't have any questions, Tim. I just thought that it was a great, really, really great presentation. Very um, nice storyline there of kind of how it all, it, it all culminates um, well, I do have one question. I always have a question. Um, you know, when we, you talk about fuels, climate, and people, you give an example of encroachment of fuels in the forest, overgrowth in the forest. In Nevada, we're, we're at the lower elevations. We're really dealing with a lot of, you know, sagebrush ecosystems. And um, can you talk a little bit about your perspective on fuels in the sagebrush and how those kind of the unique challenges that those pose? Yeah, so I don't know that we're being overrun by sagebrush, for example, like we're letting some forests get overrun uh, with undergrowth and uh, you know high tree density, uh, but 
we we do know in the Great Basin we're being overrun by cheatgrass, right, and and non-native uh, grass species around the region. So these are of course these fine fleshy fuels, and they definitely create uh, you know problems for fire. They're easily ignitable um, and and easily burnable. But we are definitely are are building our communities, you know, these are fire prone areas, uh, just like so many parts of the West. And we are, uh, you know, building in these areas. So the activities, you know, such as your program, you know, living with fire, which, uh, which I think is great, um, you know, to talk about, well, how do we, um, maybe the issues that we have to think about, you can do mitigation activities, right, to try and reduce, um, uh, risk, you know, of your home or, or business, but probably there should be conversations about how do we um, work or how do we de develop our communities to be resilient uh, to, to fire and how do we uh, be adaptive to the fact that we have this changing climate, but also, you know, we are seeing uh, you know, more extreme uh, fire events, largely because it is this combination of a lot of dry fuel, but it's also burning into neighborhoods, right? It's really impacting uh, people. And plus there's, um, I know you'll have uh, a webinar on this later, but, you know, smoke is an important issue here as well. Uh, the more of these uh, fire wildfires we have and the bigger fires, uh, smoke itself is very much a, a human health impact and a, and, a, and a firefighter health impact. Yeah, you know, my, my, my husband works in, in the fire profession and more in prescribed fire. And God, when he comes home from these, and these are, this is prescribed fires where the smoke is less toxic than these big wildfires. He's just he's wrecked for days coughing and his car his work truck smells like fire his hair smells like smoke i mean you know the, these smoke impacts are real yeah absolutely and we also need to be aware that there's the smoke from the biomass fuel yeah but once we start burning houses neighborhoods now we're really introducing a lot of additional toxins toxic smoke yeah absolutely yeah, absolutely Anybody else have any questions? I have a question. This yes, is Anne. Yeah. Yes, um, our our fire that we had here in Douglas County yesterday. Uh, fortunately, I could see it from my front door, but the wind was going. It did not bring the smoke to us. Fortunately, um, what what I know NDF had been in there and they had done fuel reduction in there, but it ripped through there. And um, I mean, the winds were horrendous here. What what caused those kind of winds? And, and they were, I know they weren't ready for it because I worked the evacuation center and nobody was ready for that kind of thing to happen at this point. Um, yeah, so I don't know a whole lot about that particular fire. I'm not caught up on that. I saw, um, uh, I thought I saw Chris Small come on here briefly. Is is he still on? No. All right. He he would be able to probably to do a better job explaining what the exact meteorological conditions are for this particular fire. I don't know that I could do that off the top of my my head. Uh, other than in broad terms, I know we've had a. Um, you know, a trough system come through. So there's uh, a big pressure difference uh, that's that's strong enough to create these. Uh, yeah, they're pretty, pretty intense winds that we've had, you know, like for three days. So, so basically this is a, it's, a, it's more what we would call a synoptic weather pattern. It's not like afternoon Zephyr kind of pattern that we often see here in, in uh, along the Eastern, side of the Sierra, uh, you know, in the summer months where it's a big low pressure over the Great Basin because it's very hot. 
um, you have higher pressure over the Pacific and that creates that that wind flow pattern. Yeah, it, it was so windy that my the waterfall that comes into my pond was blowing the water out of the waterfall, out of the, out of the pond. <laughs> so. well, that's, that's impressive, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. And by the well, way, that you. would be that would be an example of how it wasn't so hot, but an example of how wind helps evaporate. Right. Uh, yeah. Right out of lakes, rivers, soils, fuels. Yeah. Okay. Thank all right you. now, though, you're okay. You don't have to worry about the uh, the fire. Uh, no, I, it's mostly rangeland. There's sagebrush across the road from us, but. Uh, Fortunately, it's not too decadent yet okay. at this point. You know, looks like it could use a little mosaicing. It's a large area between Stephanie and, and Johnson Lane. Right. Um, what about grass? Do you have um, a lot of grass? Yeah, around? there's a yeah. Douglas County has done a pretty good job along the roads of spraying for cheatgrass and stuff. So I don't see huge amounts, and I haven't seen huge amounts across the road from us either. I, I had Douglas County come and spray my yard in the fall. Um, so I've had cheat grass, but just here and there and whatever, and I've pulled everything I could while it was green. Yeah, so, okay. Yeah, so not, not too bad. I think Douglas County has been doing a pretty good job of spraying in the fall. Yeah, good. Speaking of spraying, I, I had to spray for uh, white flies this year. This is a bad yeah. white fly year. Right, yeah, I have a few in my garden too. Yeah, all right. Sorry, I was getting off track, Jamie. Yeah, okay. <laughs> I have a quick question about the relationship, um, like just the, the resources on the ground between like the IMETs, the meteorologists that are on like the incident command teams, and then, um, the, and then uh, just how resources respond to climate. And I was wondering if you could kind of explain that a little bit more. I, cause I know like red flag warnings, for example, I know they'll probably, they'll pull resources off of projects so that they can just be staged right. in, in various areas. And um, so that they, they can respond quickly in like for the Jacks Valley fire or the Meeks fire. Like when I was, where I was working, I was on a type two crew up in Tahoe when, the, when there was a red flag warning day, we didn't do any project work. We just right. like stood on top of a hill and looks for smoke <laughs> and yeah. if there was and if there was smoke then we would we would respond really quickly but i think i just think that that uh for people to understand that there's like there's a relationship between the weather the resources and then what they themselves do as homeowners can do to prepare because if these these resources are doing you know a good job of trying to be vigilant and try to have these effective and quick responses but then also what are you know? What are things that homeowners should be doing during these like red flag warning days? Things that, I mean, and this is maybe more of a question for us, you know, as a, <laughs> as a program. But I just I just think that uh, if you could elaborate on that sort of relationship between like, the meteorologists and then the fire resources. Yeah, so you're absolutely right. I'm uh, as as we get closer to a bad days. So in other words, uh, yeah, let's think about this like a red flag is issued for tomorrow. So yeah, fire management today, like you said, they're going to be uh, gearing up for that. They, they may be increasing their staffing level. Like you say, they'll be pulling off uh, uh, crews for project work. Um, so the closer it is to an actual event, the more that they'll be pre-positioning and uh, you know, very uh, and tactical planning, right, for an event. The further away you get from the event, it becomes more and more situational awareness in a, in a lot of respects. Now, if, if um, say, predictive services tells the Forest Service Washington office or um, the Office of Wildland Fire at the Department of Interior that we think uh, the West is going to have some real problems uh, this year, you know, bright, bright red <laughs> on an outlook map. Well, that's that situational awareness for them to think about, are we going to have, are we going to have the resources 
you know, how how can we set ourselves up to um, be as efficient as possible in dispatching resources around the country? Uh, at what point are we going to have to call in outside? Are we going to bring in international support? Are we going to bring in um, Department of Defense support, you know, the Air, Air National Guard, uh, for example? So it really ranges, I, yeah, I guess, you know, from an agency perspective. Um, for a homeowner, gosh, if, if I see a red flag watch or uh, a warning, I mean, that's a sign to me that uh, if a fire happens, it could be bad because we we know what goes into those warnings. It's high winds, uh, it's uh, and dry dry air uh, corresponding to to dry fuels. So the fuels are going to be very flashy, and they they will burn quickly right in those situations. So I would want to make sure that I'm not doing anything. Uh, you know, to create a spark, uh -huh. uh, for example. I I want to make sure that, um, I mean, I should have already done this, right? Make sure I don't have wood stacked up next to my house. And, and um, uh, I mean, that's a little long-term planning, but make sure I didn't stick something up next to the house, you mm -hmm. know, that I shouldn't have. You know, little little things like that. Yeah. Yeah, I just think it's interesting how it's all, it all connects, you know, how part of the daily briefing, hourly briefing actually for firefighters is taking the weather, like firefighters take the weather every hour because yes. changes can, in weather can really drastically change the operations. So it's just really Yeah, behind point. the scenes, um, that'd be fun probably to do a little story about which is um, we have something called remote automated weather stations, ROS. I don't know if you ever had a chance to see that or use any of those, mm -mm. those data, but they collect temperature and wind and humidity and solar radiation um, and hourly, and that gets reported. Uh, it's sent through satellite. Um, up to Boise, the National Interagency Fire Center. Uh, those data actually come back to us at the Western Regional Climate Center. So we can monitor that real time, but that goes to the National Weather Service. Those data get fed into weather forecast models to help improve those forecasts. And so now there's grids of weather, grids of fire danger. <laughs> and all this data is just constantly flowing back and forth. So the IMAT, you know, when they're sitting at a site, they're working, of course, hand in hand with the fire behavior analyst. And they're looking at all this, plus their own things, you know, satellite, radar, um, sounding data, upper atmosphere, all these different things. So it's it, it's a constant flow of, of data and information. Awesome. Megan, well, you brought up, oh, sorry. What were no, you I was going to say, say and maybe more so than than certain uh, certain channels on social media. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Megan, you brought up a great point. Um, uh, we had talked about um, you know mentioning like what what can homeowners do um, you know when we were talking about this episode um, and and I would just add homeowners can you know look at a variety of resources um, you know whether it be living with fire or, or firewise or um, Red Cross um, and you know f figure out what you're going to pack for your go bag um, you know make sure that you're ready to evacuate um, follow sources closely um, whether it's like the news or on social media um, the you know the fire agencies um, you know, you can always look at the, um, uh, what's it called, the National Weather Service page and, and see if it is a wet red flag warning. Um, if there is a fire, uh, maybe be aware if you do have to evacuate. Um, if it is a red flag warning and there's no fire around you, um, I just want to reiterate what Tim was saying, you know, try not to spark a fire. You know, um, be careful if you're you're weed whacking during a red flag warning. Um, you know, target shooting, um, parking your vehicle on dried weeds, um, dragging your chains, things like that. 
Um, mm -hmm. So it, it really is a, an effort, um, not only just with the, you know, weather folks and the, and the fire agencies, um, but it's the public too. Um, yeah. There's multiple things we can do. So thanks for asking that. Great points. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It was interesting last night at the evacuation center. Um, not a single person came with a to-go box. And not that I know of that anybody had a to go box in their in their car, because I talked to people, they most I didn't have anybody who didn't have medications. They all gathered up their medications, but they came no clothes, you know, absolutely nothing. So the next time we have an evacuation center, I'm going to take my to go box. And next time I work at it, I'm going to take the list of things to go in a to-go box. Mark Reagan's list, that, that list is really good. It's pretty extensive. And the living with fire information and start teaching them at the evacuation center because they have nothing else to do. And they're all ears at that point. <laughs> you know, they're really Actually, interested. That's a really good point, Anne. That that's like an educational opportunity for our program. It, it is. It is like the best. Who's, who's in charge of the evac centers for every county? We should get them resources that they can pass out to people during an evacuation. Absolutely. Jamie, take a note of that for us to talk about. Yeah, yeah, and uh, you know, it's usually emergency management. You know, is in charge of that, or or the you know they call in. We we activated the Red Cross about nine thirty last night um cert always does the douglas county evacuation center um but we uh activated red cross because we had about 45 to 50 people in the evacuate in the shelter last night and we didn't have enough cots and stuff in our cert trailer so we activated mm -hmm. the red cross to bring more cots and and whatever uh, it ended up that people were, some people were able to go back to their homes and whatever. Um, mm -hmm. So we didn't really, we, they gave us 20, but we didn't have to use them. So, you know, it, it was, it was a really interesting night and you were talking about resources getting there. Um, it was around probably between just after eight, I would say. And I heard resources coming in from Owens Valley. That's Bishop mm. in that area. You know. So they were getting resources in fairly quickly. Seemed like I heard you know, other resources coming from other areas around here and whatever too. Um, so I, it, was, it was a pretty interesting and educational night for all of us who try to educate people. I wonder if the reason why people were caught so off guard is uh, like Tim mentioned, you know, usually the busier fire months are July I and August are like our peak fire months. That that's exactly what happened was mm -hmm. that they did not were not ready for fire to happen yet, and the the community center had been shut down for COVID, only been opened up for you know like a week or mm -hmm. a week or two, you mm -hmm. know, so everything just was not in place. I mean, the search team did a really good job of getting everything, you know, together, but we, we couldn't find enough coffee, you know, and just, you know, stuff like that, because things really weren't, weren't organized and ready. And I feel like that ties into why we wanted to do a workshop about weather and climate and how it influences wildfire, because, right, and the impacts that have, that those factors have on people being prepared, because, um, I feel like people are used to like looking like just kind of waking up in July and being like, okay, it's time to get ready for wildfire. And right. it, that doesn't really, those aren't the conditions anymore. Like this right. could happen in November or yeah. March. <laughs> so we, we didn't, yeah, it was different yesterday because we didn't have the heat. You know, it was relatively cool yesterday, but we did have the dry conditions and the wind. And those were the two prevailing conditions that, you know, came about to cause that fire so and I mean it ripped through there it was the first time I looked it was 10 acres I mean maybe a few minutes later it was 100 acres you know a couple of hours after that it was 700 acres yeah you know, so I mean it really ripped through there yeah but I think that 
You're right. It was cold. It's been cold this week. And so that throws people off too. Um, but you know, we're, we're, we're always trying to push wildfire knows no season. Don't I think know. it's after the 4th of July, you know, cause that's historically like the 4th of July is usually that, okay, now there's wildfires due to fireworks. And now we're on for the rest of the season until October. Right. But I think, you know, um, in California, at least, I know this to be true that the fuel temperatures last month in our fuel temperatures, fuel moistures in May of last month were as low as they get in like an average year. So there's already really low starting. I mean, this could be a really bad fire season. I just know all the details in California because my husband works there in fire. So I, I, I get all the intel, yeah. but um, yeah, I mean, we're, it's going to be tricky. And this is a good segue for Tim to talk about current conditions. All right. So I will put a few things together. I'll share my screen again. Um, yeah, I think some of the graphics I showed you, I mean, I pulled those graphics from different bits and pieces, but uh, this is the, what we call a 10 hour fuel moisture. So this is the really fine, fine fuels and uh, those that are able to respond very quickly to dryness uh, in, in the atmosphere. And as you can see a lot of, um, of this red, if these darker reds are, um, yeah, these are approaching all time uh, kind of dryness uh, here. So uh, yes, much, much of the way, including California, as, as you just highlighted, is um, very low uh, fuel moistures. Uh, these are uh, a bit of the heavier kind of fuels. Uh, typically think of these more with uh, uh, the forest type fuels. Uh, but again, these brown colors, these, these are low. Um, and so many places in, in California, yeah, are, are at their lowest. I mean, they're record level uh, dryness. And in terms of the fire danger class, um, yeah, this is June 9th. Uh, but yeah, some places are showing up as extreme uh, fire danger, uh, very high to, to extreme. So those are the current conditions from that fire danger perspective. Uh, I forgot to update this this morning, uh, the new drought monitor that comes out on Thursdays. Um, I doubt it's going to look all that different. I mean, these don't change <laughs> all that quickly. Uh, so yeah, for us, uh, we're under extreme drought, but a lot of places are under exceptional drought. Again, meaning this is you know exceptional uh, dryness. And you may have heard in the news, for example, like Lake Mead is going to fall below a level that's going to uh, trigger some uh, pretty significant actions in terms of water flow and availability. Oh, uh, you know, we talked about uh, this evaporative demand. Uh, so the, this is uh, as of June 4th. I uh, didn't get around to updating this. Uh, this can change uh, fairly quickly because this is responding. What goes into this is temperature, humidity, wind speed, and solar radiation. And so uh, this probably would, would look a little different now. But again, the point being is uh, any of this uh, red and orange is really sucking the moisture out of the fuels. And so we're actually uh, going to be spinning up a project here to look at uh, a research project to look in more detail about what how what this index might mean for actual fuel flammability uh, itself. 
Um, I did show this before, but yeah, this is the current state of the critical fuels. So uh, there are certainly concerns here in Southern Nevada and, and the Southern half of Utah and even bits uh, near us uh, uh, going out here on, on I-80. But um, for our immediate neighborhood at the moment, uh, from this doesn't mean we can't have fire, but it's not a kind of critical level. I don't think we'd be expecting you know problematic uh, fire at the moment. Uh, did already show you that because what I showed in, in the story was the actual real uh, outlooks. So a uh, think of it as a warm, a warm and, and dry summer. <laughs> Probably used to that by now. And then these are the uh, the outlooks. So these are the real outlooks. Um, so June uh, again for us. Um, not expecting anything especially problematic. You don't have to go too far over the hill, though, uh, where there could be on that side. But right now, um, from a national perspective, yeah, a lot of focus on the southwest and what might be going on here in the eastern uh, Great Basin. As we shift in July, it, it moves north. So there's an expectation that the southwest monsoon uh, will mitigate the fire season here as it usually does, but the area expands north and now we're seeing larger areas of California, Pacific Northwest, and up into the Northern Rockies. And by August, it shifts in, even further north now or expands that Northern area. Um, this, is, this is a lot. And if California takes off, if the Northwest takes off, and Northern Rockies takes off, that's that's a lot of fuel uh, to burn. And and if if all this were to be happening at significant levels at the same time, it will definitely stretch uh, resources. And um, there'll be a lot of media stories about this year's fire season again. So oh, then September. Oh, sorry, yeah, Tim, I thought you were done. September to conclude. Um, it's this remains though in California and Pacific Northwest uh, into September. <laughs> oh, and then I put art. I put art in. I put art in my things. Yeah, so you had a question there, Jamie? I was, um, I just wanted to highlight, um, if anybody's interested in, in seeing what these outlooks are, they can go to predictive services and, and, um, they, they have videos, um, they, they have, um, more information on their website so they can look into that if you're interested. Absolutely. Um, Tim, I really enjoy how you have brought this storyline together. I don't think that, um, most people realize that you know, there is a timeline for, for wildfire and there's different parameters that go into this. Um, and so I, I've really enjoyed this. Um, and so I want to say thank, thank you. you for that. Yeah, no, thank you for having me. It's, uh, it's fun. Yeah.